I love living in Japan. I've been here for almost 30 years now. So you would think that I would get used to uh, small spaces. And living in the big city, I have had to get used to uh, not having enough space sometimes. Uh, if I were in the countryside living in my husband's uh, family home, things might be different. But living in Tokyo, I uh, space is an issue for me. And sometimes I can't handle it. Sometimes I don't have the yo-yo to deal with um, small spaces. Um, yo-yo is a word used in daily conversation to indicate uh, your ability or wherewithal to handle something. And depending on the context, having yo-yo could mean, for example, you have enough money to buy something, or you can afford it, or you have enough time or the energy, the experience, the patience, the space um, to do what you need to do. You, you basically, you have the wherewithal to handle it. But when you don't have yo-yo, it means, of course, you don't have enough money or time or energy or bandwidth. And today, in this case, you don't have enough space to do what you want to do or to be who you want to be. Uh, hi, I'm Marcy Kobayashi, and if you're new here, uh, Finding Yo-Yo is a memoir about the year I helped my mother-in-law transition into a nursing home and prepare for end-of-life care and tried to understand and navigate Alzheimer's for my father-in-law, who came to live with us in Tokyo, and helped my husband through a chemo-free recovery from stage 3 colon cancer. And uh, most of the time, I had Yo-Yo to help them and be with them, but uh, sometimes I didn't. And today, I want to share a portion of the memoir that I've been working on where I didn't have Yo-Yo. And um, let me back up for a second. Uh, I've been working on this book for a while. I wrote the first draft back in 2018 and then put it aside and uh, last year, I started uh, from the encouragement of a friend. I started sharing a piece each week to get me back in the writer's chair and to re-edit um, or edit it so that I could get ready to publish it. And we're coming to the close to the end. Um, this is one section that um, is probably still longer than it needs to be, but I'm going to share it as it is now. So you may be able to hear this part of it. And when you actually buy the book and read it, you may find that some parts of this um, are no longer there. So <laughs> sit back uh, and enjoy. I'll be reading from the page in front of me. Coming out of New Year's, I was on a high. We had rounded a corner and compared with the last 12 months, the year ahead of us felt predictable. Otosan had a new hobby. Akira was back to regular back to a regular teaching schedule, and Okasan enjoyed our weekly visits to the nursing home. The long year of adjusting to new living arrangements and eating styles was over, so January was the perfect month for me to finally get back to work, too. Akira and I had shared office space for years. We worked well side by side, but not when I wanted to write, think, or dialogue with my spirit guides. Since Otosan had come to live with us, I habitually moved from room to room throughout the day. I started in the living room until the guys woke up and the TV came on, and I would then begin making breakfast. After breakfast, I planted myself in our office until Akira came in to start work, when I would then move to the bedroom, camping out on the bed until lunch. If I was lucky, Otosan went out for a walk after lunch, and I could enjoy the living room again until dinner. If he didn't go out, I took myself out for a walk and sat in a cafe. With such a tiny condo, I didn't think there was any other way. On most days, I didn't mind the tight quarters and shared spaces. I really loved our condo. I felt like an eagle nested high on a cliff. Even so, there were moments when I craved a space of my own. During the first week of the year, before many businesses were open and most of the country was still on holiday, I spent time redecorating my side of our home office. I created a giant vision board in honor of the new calendar year and spent several days writing out my goals. I actively looked for signs from nature spirits and set up a personal altar in the corner to remind me of my intentions for the year. I felt so relaxed and inspired in that space. I proudly showed Akira how I had transformed my corner into a sacred sanctuary to do my work. I loved having a dedicated space for my work and for a few weeks it was wonderful. 
After Akira left for the university, I would go into my newfound sanctuary. Sitting at my desk, I could see Mount Fuji in the distance. I wondered why I had not taken the time to clear the space for my work sooner. From my little sanctuary in our office, I imagined the days of moving around room to room were over. After all, Akira was at the university on most days, and I could enjoy uninterrupted hours at my desk. However, Akira's classes were over by the end of January, and then he no longer needed to go to campus. Naturally, he returned to spending most days at home, which meant he was using the home office again, too. Instead of enjoying my sacred workspace, I found myself revert to moving room to room. Resentment was building. I just wanted to be in my sacred space. One morning, I couldn't stand the situation any longer. I couldn't focus. All I could hear was Akira at his desk next to me, clacking away at his computer, oblivious to my irritation. After I snarled something impolite, he shut his ears and sat facing his computer, continuing to work. I knew we wouldn't be talking again for a while, and I seethed. I wanted to lash out at him again, but my words would be pointless. He was calmly ignoring my bad behavior, so I lashed out at myself. I quietly tore down my vision board, shredded all the affirmations and pictures, and cleared away everything from my altar, leaving an empty space. My corner of the tiny home office I shared with Akira was now bare, besides my desk, chair, and computer. So there, I thought. I felt almighty, righteous. With clenched teeth, I moved into the kitchen and, muffled with a dish towel, smashed two cups, mementos from online programs I had recently taken. Next, I smashed two daruma and a maneki neko, Japanese knickknacks for setting intentions and inviting in wealth. All three knickknacks had been sitting on the altar next to my desk. Shaking inside, I gathered the remnants of my vision board and with the broken cups and knickknacks, quietly slipped out the front door and down to the garbage bins behind our condo. After I got back upstairs, I sat on the sofa in the living room. I was no longer shaking, but by no means calm. What did all the destruction mean about me? Wasn't I hurting a bit of myself in the process? I still felt furious. I wasn't angry at the things I removed or destroyed. I still believed in vision boards, altars, and affirmations as useful tools. Nope. I wasn't angry at those things. I was angry at myself for having put them out there. Not like when you share something and later wish you hadn't because you feel exposed or embarrassed. No. I was angry at myself because I didn't know why, and that made me angrier. I swore a few times, pulled my hair, slapped my hands down on the top of my thighs, cried, slapped my hands down again. I was a mess. I want to say that after a nap and a few hours, I started to feel better, but I didn't. I stopped being angry and instead felt depressed. Then, if I tried to talk with Akira or he tried to say anything to me, I got mad all over again. I moped around the rest of the day and was careful not to say a word to Akira. If Otosan noticed, he didn't say anything. For days, I took extra naps and went to bed soon after dinner, skipping our favorite TV shows. I sat alone on the side of the bed, weeping, not sure why, and unable to stop the tears. I started to forget why I had been angry and instead began dwelling on all the things I felt I had to do and how I had no energy or desire to do any of them. All I wanted to do was go to sleep and not wake up. I thought about how wonderful it would be if I didn't have to wake up in the morning and continue this life. I wanted to go home to that place where we come from before life. But the energy it would take to make that happen for real seemed too taxing. And eventually, I would fall asleep. In the morning, I made coffee and the cycle repeated. Then, one night as I sat like a lump on the side of the bed, I realized somebody else could do all those things that I thought I had to do. I felt bile rise in the back of my throat. In my head, I went through every task I could think of and confirmed that someone else could do them just as easily as me. There wasn't anything special about me. I was dispensable. Otosan didn't need me. Akira didn't need me either. I was replaceable. It was shocking, maddening, and depressing. If they didn't need me, then what was I? What was I supposed to do? 
After a restless night of strange dreams, I got up at 4.30 and started to write. I needed to find some resolution. February 1st, 2016. What to do? It just gets worse. I have no idea how to communicate with Akira. I feel a little dead inside. Dead would be preferable. My head feels heavy, like there's a dull gray fog around my head. Today, writing feels pointless. I don't have a clue what to say. No energy to do more than avoid Akira. I feel wronged. I'm smart enough to know that the fault is never with one person or the other. It's a collaboration. And I'm smart enough to know that there might be something chemically unbalanced in my body. It is not normal to cry every day, to sit on the bed and weep. I don't know how to cry for help. Do I just keep going until I'm crazy? I think I'm already there. Okay, universe, I'm crying out for help. I feel miserable and stuck. Do you want me to keep supporting Otosan and Akira? Marcy, here you are in the same place you've been so many times before. We are standing by and all you need to do is ask. Why can't I ask Akira? Why can't he notice the burden I am carrying? Marcy, you already know part of the answer. Is it really a burden? Are you really in such a difficult time compared with so many around the world? And why is it him? Why is it Akira that needs to notice and help? Why are you limiting where the help could come from? This is your ego speaking. You do not need for Akira to notice. And besides, he's incapable of noticing right now. But that is not fair. That is not fair. I want him to see, to notice, to acknowledge. I want to be thanked. I want to be recognized. Marcy, why is that necessary? Why does that matter? Is that really what you want to say? No, it is not. It is not the real issue. I don't know how to ask for help. If I ask Akira for help, I don't trust that he will give it willingly. I'm afraid it will be begrudgingly. Marcy, simply ask. Please help me out of this situation. Please help me. I have been here in this murky space before. Do you have words for me today? Marcy, be aware of everything around you. Can you stop and feel the breath? Feel the movement of your body as you take in the air and all the energy around you? Why do you insist on getting energy from others when you can tap into the universe? Thank you for your help. I'm starting to feel a little better. I wasn't feeling better, though. I didn't really like what my guides were implying and sat with a frown glued to my face for several minutes. Then I heard Otosan stirring, so I closed my computer and started preparing breakfast. Akira had a meeting that day and left shortly after breakfast. We still hadn't spoken, so he sent me a text message letting me know he would be home for dinner and wishing me a good day. Naturally, I did not respond. I still wanted to be angry with him. Otosan left after breakfast. He had day service, so I had the place to myself until 4 p.m. I could have used my sacred workspace that day, but went back to bed instead. Tossing and turning under the covers, I thought about the message from my guides. I didn't want to ask anyone for help. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to even be here. I thought again about how no one really needed me. Someone else could do the shopping, do the laundry, prepare the meals. Someone else could work with my clients. I was still replaceable, after all. I yearned to go to sleep and not wake up. I thought about all the years I had joked about it, even though I wasn't joking inside. I really didn't want to be here. Not like this. But who would believe such words coming from an otherwise happy-go-lucky gal? I felt empty. Void was the only word I could think of. And then I caught a tiny thread trying to surface. What if? What if there was no reason not to be me? If no one needed me, and if no longer being here seemed like a better option, then I had nothing to lose. If I was willing to leave it all behind and give up this life, then what if I just lived from the inside out? What if I started being me all the time? What if instead of molding myself around other people and their needs, their values, their beliefs, I started radiating my own needs, values, and beliefs? What if I became the center of my being in this current life? Ugh, it sounded so American, so self-centered, so egotistical. It also sounded promising. I sat up. I already felt my mood shifting and easing up of the dark heaviness I had been holding tight around me. Setting aside all the to-dos, because someone else could do those, 
I started looking at what I felt I needed. Obviously, space was at the top of my list. Sharing space with Akira was what had triggered this whole week of misery, after all. I had to admit that I harbored resentment toward Otosan that he had his own room, even though I loved that we could provide the space for him. I was even resentful that Akira had both an office at the university and space at home to work. Mind you, I loved that his books and files were all in our home office and not scattered or stacked throughout the home as they had been before. Finally, I had to admit that when I redecorated my half of the home office and built my sanctuary, I had conveniently ignored the fact that it was a shared space. It was unfair of me to be angry and resentful towards Akira for using the agreed-upon shared space. So how to create a sanctuary just for me? Of course, remodeling our condo or finding a new home were options, but not immediate answers. Maybe there was another way. If I couldn't create a physical sanctuary, I had to carry the sacred sanctuary within me. My guides told me to stop depending on others for energy and to look within and access the universe for energy. Maybe I could apply the same idea to my sense of space. I wasn't wasn't exactly sure how to do it, but it was simple. Create the sanctuary within and carry it with me. I sat there for a long time on the side of the bed. I remember the sun streaming in through the gap between the lace curtains and warming my feet. It felt like morning, though it couldn't have been, because the window faces west. Finally, I stood up and stretched. Otosan would be home soon, so I headed for the kitchen and started preparing dinner. Things were different after that. Okay, (laughs) I'd like to say that magically I created this wonderful sanctuary inside me and carried this sense of space all the time, but um, it didn't happen immediately, but that period of time really was the point where things changed for me and going forward uh, some of the ways that we interacted with Otosan and dealt with our daily life really changed and that's what I hope I can introduce in the next um, few excerpts are what were some of the real changes that we made um, that helped me. (laughs) So and this is the space that I do now work in and I'm so happy and grateful that I have um, a sanctuary both inside and outside to work now. Um, That's all for today. Um, I'll be back next week.